All these children are addicted to drugs. The teacher's just been going along the row of children, telling me how old these children are, what they're addicted to. All of these little children in this row are addicted to heroin. This is a hidden side of Afghanistan, where the most vulnerable are paying a heavy price for war. Yahi, I just said to me, I'm here because I need to kick my habit, and I'm on powder. He means heroin. Where children are haunted by the horror they've witnessed. The teacher said that this little boy has just arrived today. Today will be his first day in detox. And where children are hoping to regain their lost childhoods. Kabul is known to the world as a place of checkpoints and suicide bombs. But it's a city with a hidden side. We're in West Kabul, in one of the poorest parts of the city, one of the highest rates of unemployment. I'd been told something was happening here that until recently was unknown in Kabul. Hundreds of addicts gathering to buy and take drugs. We've heard that the spot is under the bridge here. Hello. Right, this is the bridge. And there's a really, really bad stench. It's a dried riverbed here, full of rubbish. Hello, Migira. Oh, wow, look at this scene. There are a few hundred men here, crouched among the rubbish and looking at the floor. It's just full of needles. And you can see people using all around me. The men were happy to talk to me. They told me that over 600 addicts use drugs here every day. And there are over 20 spots like this throughout the city. She has the father Heroin, Tariyak. Heroin. This gentleman here says everybody here is taking heroin. The UN estimates that 8% of the adult population has a drug problem, but the men told me of a new development. <laughs> Every day, more and more young boys were turning up under the bridge, and they were all addicts. They called one boy over. Ibrahim is only 15. He'd been smoking heroin since he was 13. How many of your friends take drugs? <laughs> Ibrahim says that five of his friends, who are the same age as him, 15, are using drugs. He said he suffered from depression. Ibrahim says he started taking drugs because both his parents were killed eight years ago in the war in bombings. Other boys arrived to speak to me. The stories they told were of lives and families torn apart by the war. Uh -huh. Najib is 16 and started using heroin when he was just 12 years old. Najib says that most of his friends use drugs. Yeah, they start young, they start from 11 years old. Over the last eight years, drug cartels have started to refine their vast opium poppy harvests into heroin, a more addictive and profitable drug. Now the Afghan street price for powder, as it's known, is the cheapest in the world. Some of the men under the bridge said that boys hang out on top of the bridge here. We met another young addict, 15-year-old Ali, who'd been using heroin for the past two years. Ali says he's brought his drugs, and now he's going to go and do them somewhere else. Ali's mother was dead, and his father had fled to Iran. He took me to where he was now sleeping rough, in a little park on a traffic island. Ali preferred smoking away from the squalor under the bridge. He'd bought a wrap of heroin, about a gram, for just over one pound. I wanted to know why he was so heavily addicted at such a young age. First he'd witnessed a suicide bomb in Kabul, then he went to stay with relatives in the countryside. He says while he was there, the Americans bombed his village and dozens of people died. He saw bodies scattered everywhere. And he and other villagers had to pick up the bits of body and put them in plastic bags. 
Ali said the war in Afghanistan breaks his heart. He says, I'd, I'd rather not live than live through this war. Sometimes I just want to kill myself. The psychological damage of the war and the flood of cheap heroin have contributed to addiction rates doubling in the last five years. We were told that the problem was so severe among the child population that some were taking desperate measures to fund their habits. One child agreed to meet us at a safe house and asked for his identity not to be revealed. Mukhtar is 13 years old and started taking heroin after his parents were killed by shelling in the city. He explained how he came into contact with the drug. From the age of eight years old, he used to be paid money by drug addicts to guard them when they were doing their drugs. He started to smoke when he was nine, and soon he was struggling to feed his habit. Mukta, how do you earn the money for drugs? He pays for heroin by working as a child prostitute. Mukta says there's a man who looks after me. I stay with him at night, and that's how I get money for drugs. At nine years old, did you know what was happening to you? Did you know what sex was? Mukhtar said he'd learnt about prostitution from other users. He says that children are selling their bodies here because there are no jobs, there's no work, many of them addicted. What would happen to you if people knew? He told me that homosexual relationships and prostitution are taboo in Afghanistan. They're looked upon very badly, and if you're caught, you could be shot dead. While I had met child addicts from broken families on the street, I was told there was also an increasing hidden epidemic affecting parents and children in their homes. So we're going to meet a group of doctors and social workers who make home visits in the old city in the centre of Kabul. In this deeply conservative society, drug addiction is seen as a dishonour. So the Najat medical team have to visit families who are too ashamed to seek help. I asked Dr. Shinkai Minawal how bad the drug situation was among families here. In this area, there are about 130,000 families. And she says that 60% of them are addicted to drugs here. Dr. Shinkai said many men had picked up their addictions working in neighboring Iran and Pakistan. The men use drugs as a stimulant to help them work longer hours. We've just arrived to the family, the first family we're visiting. In the last few years, workers have started to return home, bringing their habits with them. Karima's husband was one of them. He'd now passed on his addiction to his entire family. Karima says she's got six children, and she pointed to this little girl here and says that her 14-year-old girl smokes opium, and she just showed me her little stash of opium. Karima says she smokes opium every day, three times a day. According to the UN, half of all drug users in Afghanistan give opium to their children. Everybody stop talking now because somebody's at the door outside. And they've become, they've become very nervous. There's a lot of stigma involved in drug addiction. We've been told we have to stop filming, we have to leave. We've got to put the camera down now. That just goes to show what a sensitive subject drug addiction can be in this country. An angry group of locals had gathered in front of the house and they were demanding to know what the doctors and social workers were doing. So we had to sneak out the back of the house, but the doctor told us to get out the area as soon as possible because situations like that can easily escalate. We just spoke to the doctors and they told us that they've made it back here to the center. Dr. Shinkai said that drugs are haram or forbidden in Islam. The doctor says that this is very dangerous work they're doing, that their team is frequently attacked. They've had stones thrown at them and they've even been beaten up. 
She said more and more children were becoming addicted because the country is awash with heroin and opium. The doctor says if the government doesn't do anything about this situation, Afghanistan is going to face another disaster. I was about to discover another reason why drug addiction is destroying Afghanistan's children. Hundreds of thousands of Afghans have had to flee their homes because of fighting in the south of the country. Many have come here to Kabul and are living in makeshift shanty towns scattered across the city. The Charhaya Rambar camp is home to over 5,000 people who have fled fighting in Helmand province. Most have no access to hospitals or schools. I'm going to meet a man from a charity called Ashiana that provides basic services for the refugee camp. And he's going to take me in and introduce me to some families. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Name man Rami Tahas. Name Sayyid Najibullah. Asad Najibullah said there were many child addicts here and not just for psychological reasons. Once again, the war was to blame. He says many of the children here have lost limbs because of the war. They've been severely affected by what's happened to them and they're very poor and they've got no money for medicine. Uh -huh. He introduced me to Zarima, who was hooked on opium. This little girl is three years old and you can see that she's lost her arm. Her brother told me that their village had been attacked. There was fighting between the insurgents and the government, and then all of a sudden everything in sight was bombed. They didn't care whether they were enemy or not. They bombed all the civilians, and that's when his little sister lost her arm. Her father, Mirajan, said he had no option but to give his little girl opium. He says, I couldn't get to a doctor. There was no medicine. What could I do? Since then, Mirajan had tried to stop giving her opium, but she'd suffered severe withdrawal symptoms. I asked Mirajan when he thinks Zarima will stop taking opium, and he just said simply, well, I'll have to give her opium because she's an addict. Najibullah took us to meet another family. Salam alaikum. Goljumer is also addicted to opium. Her father told me what happened. Said Ghulam has just showed us his 10-year-old daughter here. A bomb hit their house during fighting. He lost four of his children. Two of his children were badly injured, including Goljumer. There had been no doctors in the village to help. This little girl's arm wasn't completely amputated, and there was a local man in the village that knew something of medicine, who had to amputate her arm, and you can imagine the pain she must have been in. That had happened two years ago, and she was still in pain. Now opium was part of her daily life. He says that he doesn't have much money, but he still has to give his daughter opium, and he says that opium is much cheaper than a painkiller that you get in a chemist. And he says you just need a tiny little bit of opium to ease the pain. It's very strong. The families I met were left to fend for themselves. Government doctors rarely come to the camp and too few aid agencies are equipped to deal with child addicts. I wanted to find out the extent of drug use outside the capital. We headed 300 miles north to Badakhshan, one of the most remote and poorest areas of Afghanistan. You can see just how isolated this area is. In the last five hours we've been driving, we've only passed a couple of cars. Every now and again you can see a village dotted in the mountains. And for six months a year, most of this area is completely cut off from the outside world when it snows during winter. Criminal cartels, insurgent groups and corrupt government officials reportedly smuggle a quarter of all Afghan heroin through these valleys into neighboring countries. The province also used to be one of the main opium poppy growing areas until an attempted eradication campaign. We went to a former opium farming village, Razrak, to find out what had happened since then. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. 
مشکلات بزرگ چی هن اینجا؟ نفوس داره Chief Dwarbeg told me there were 400 people in his village, and now all of them used opium. He says we've got so many problems in this village, but our biggest problem is drugs. We've got so many villagers who are addicted. Men, women, and even the children of our village are all addicted to drugs. We were taken to meet a family. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Name man Rami Tahast. Talib Shah and his wife Mary Nagar told me out of their six children, three of them were opium addicts. Eleven-year-old Sangin Mamad had been smoking the drug since he was three years old. As soon as his dad said, it's time to smoke, he jumped up, knew exactly what to do. He just put his head on the pillow and he lay down here and he's just waiting for his dad to give him opium. Talib Shah explained his son has to smoke three times a day, otherwise he suffers from painful withdrawal symptoms. I'm just talking to Sangi Mamad and it's really sad because he's just a little boy but he's just out of it. He's talking to me in a whisper you just saw, and he says that when he doesn't smoke, he feels real pain. And I asked him, do you, do you ever go out and play with the kids, play with other kids? And he said, no, no, I'm just in pain. When I make well, I don't know. Mary Nagar originally gave her son opium to cure a stomach ache, but now the family take the drug for a very different reason. Mary Nagar says there's not enough food to feed the whole family, and when you smoke opium, you lose your appetite. Why don't you spend your money on food rather than opium? Talib Shah said food was more expensive than opium. To feed the whole family for a day costs about three pounds, but to buy about this much opium, which lasts a day, costs about two pounds. And when they take this, they feel less hungry, so they eat less. Do you have food in the house now? Mary Nagar just brought me over to show me what food they've got to eat tonight. There's this flask of tea and just these two pieces of dried old bread. And this is to feed nine people in this family. Mary Nagar saying this bread is all we've got. We've got nothing. No meat, no fruit, no vegetables. Hitchi, nothing. Outside, Joabek said they used to make enough money from growing opium to buy food. But since the government destroyed their opium crops, they had lost their livelihoods. Along with not being able to provide themselves with food, he said they no longer could afford basic medicine. Opium here is the answer to everything. They rely on drug dealers that come round from village to village, he says, selling the drugs, and they service the whole area. Joabeg said what worried him the most was the rising number of child addicts in the village. The chief said it will be a disaster if the children of the village are not treated for drug addiction. Access to drug rehabilitation in Afghanistan is severely limited. There's only one center in Kabul that helps children. Funded by the U.S. State Department, Sangha Amaj was originally set up to treat women. But recently, patients were turning up with their children, who were also addicts. There's only room for 20 children. For the first part of the treatment, they're forced off the drugs, a process known as cold turkey. This causes excruciating headaches, joint pain, vomiting, and shivering. I was taken to see a new arrival, nine-year-old Kalandar. This little boy has just arrived today. Today will be his first day in detox, his first day of withdrawal, and he's addicted to opium. And you can see he doesn't look very happy, he doesn't look very well, and you can see it in his eyes. The children here were at varying stages of their 45-day treatment. 
Most of them were from poor families whose parents had heard of the center through word of mouth. Uh -huh. The teacher's just been going along the row of children, telling me how old these children are, what they're addicted to. All of these little children on this row are addicted to heroin. It's just incredible, they're so young, it's hard to believe that we're in a room full of drug addicts and they're all toddlers and tiny, small children. I spoke to some of the children about their experience. These little boys are in detox right now. It's only their third day. I asked five-year-old Yahya if he knew why he was here. Yahya said that I'm here to kick the habit because I'm on powder. He means heroin. Rahula explained why his little brother had been taught to smoke heroin. He says that he was given it because he had toothache. He says that his addiction got so bad that he'd cry when he didn't have it and he'd start chewing old bags of heroin. Twelve-year-old Chaman became addicted by inhaling her father's heroin smoke. I asked her if giving up was hard and she said, it was really hard, it took a week and the whole of my body burnt and ached. One of the doctors, Latifa Hamidi, said in the past two years there'd been a 60% increase in the number of child addicts turning up. She told me the future of the country was at stake. The doctor says there's going to be a generation of drug addicts that need help, that aren't going to be able to work. Chaman was at the end of her treatment and was now being allowed to return home. Her mother Layla had come to pick her up. <laughs> You can see that Chaman is smiling now. She was crying when she left the center. That's because she's just found out that her father's not home. Chaman's father became addicted to heroin while working in Iran. When he smoked at home, drug dependency spread through the family. Even Chaman's one and a half year old brother was affected. Duro, dubo. Layla told me Chaman had already completed rehab once before, but it had failed. She went first of all when the whole family went, but she was affected by it yet again when Layla's husband returned. Chaman and her family appear to be stuck in a vicious cycle. They know that when the father returns, they'll become addicts again. All Chaman wishes for in her future is that her father stops using heroin. She says, I just want him to get better. UK aid to Afghanistan is being increased by 40%. None of it is currently dedicated to any drug treatment programs. While the world's focus is on the fight against the Taliban, Afghanistan is being consumed from within by an equally serious and long-term threat. If you want to find out more about drug addiction in Afghanistan or any other issue covered on Unreported World, please visit our website at channel4.com slash unreported world.